again, I appreciate Jason and Russ giving me the opportunity to come up here again and speak. I, um, I spoke in Jason's absence a couple weeks ago when they were in North Carolina, I believe, so that was a good time. It was uh, me at the 9.30 and Russ at the 10.45, and uh, it was good, good stuff. But um, like Jason said, I think Russ is out of town on vacation, so um, he asked me to speak. And Frank was joking around with me because I said this was round two for me, but Frank said round one up in the big, big boy chair. <laughs> but no, I'm excited. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I, I think I know everybody in here, but my name is Todd St. Louis. Um, I met Jason just briefly. I met Jason about a year ago, randomly at a doctor's office. And... Uh, we started talking Bible a little bit, and he invited me out to his house study on Wednesday nights. And uh, I brought a friend of mine who is uh, now going to USF as a freshman. But um, we studied the Bible with Jason quite a bit, and it was really good because it, it was uh, dispensational teaching, which I was very, um, I was young, I should say, or, or just getting introduced to that. And... Uh, you know, Jason and I had a connection and a friendship to where we could really dive in and, and, and learn, or I could learn. Um, and then one thing led to another. I, I started coming to church and uh, really started getting established and, dived, and diving in a little bit. So it's been a uh, fast year. I think I met Jason in July of last year, and it's already August of 2013. But without being too long-winded, I do appreciate the opportunity to be up here and talk a little bit. So last time I spoke, um, I talked about some divisions in the church and how based on, or not based, but in my experience with talking to friends and reaching out to family and stuff like that, um, what I have been preaching is not very popular to the majority of the individuals that I come across. And mostly what I emphasize is the cross, which personally... I don't know if I really understood the magnitude of the cross until really studying here at Suncoast with Russ, Jason, and so on and so forth. Um, and when I emphasize the cross to the people I'm talking to, whether it be friends or family, it doesn't really, it's not sufficient enough for their justification. And I think everybody in here knows how much we emphasize justification, salvation, sanctification, and redemption solely based on your faith. Now, we all know, or, or most of us are, are privy to the understanding that we are sanctified by Christ, right? We're sanctified, we're actually put in Christ and made perfect, but we can also sanctify ourselves by mortifying the deeds of the flesh, which we should do. Right? I mean, we, we should strive to do that each and every day. But the, the initial understanding of the cross and what that does for us, based on my ministry, has really given me heat, or I've taken heat from friends and family, just because to them, I, to them clearly, it, it, it's not enough. You know, we need to have the cross, and then we need to repent continually. We need to uh, make Jesus Lord of our lives. We need to... Uh, bear fruits, we need to X, Y, and Z, get baptized, and so on and so forth. And I appreciate Jason and I when we studied a while back because Jason took me through Rome, or Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and really stressed to me and showed me how Jesus Christ showed us that law that was given to Moses and how he actually amplified it, which then condemned every one of us. I won't really get into that much today, but if you look at the law of Moses, you see how there's a bunch of different ordinances, commandments, statutes, so on and so forth. And even if you think you can keep all those, your thoughts and your mindset will condemn you even to a greater extent. So once you realize that you're a lawbreaker in every sense, the only thing you can really rely on is the justification by the cross. So basically, re referring back to a couple weeks ago when I spoke, um, I guess our cornerstone scripture was 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10. And if you'll turn there, I'll start to read. 
Now Paul gives his standard introduction to the church of Corinth in the beginning of the chapter. But the first turning point or the first topic of discussion are these divisions. Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We'll carry on through verse 17. He says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross should be made of none effect. So again, notice how Paul makes his introduction into the chapter, you know, by, by extending grace and peace to, to the church. But then his first issue, or his first direction in the book is the reprimand of the divisions. You know, I gave several examples of, of my life and my ministry, and, and a few of which are pretty discouraging to me because I'm reaching out or I'm talking to family, and um, there's clearly divisions. I'm saying you can be justified and deal with many different sins, but that doesn't negate your salvation. And, and a lot of the family members I've talked to say, no, that's wrong. You absolutely have to be perfect. You have to do X, Y, and Z. You cannot be a liar. You cannot be a homosexual and be justified. And for me, that's discouraging not because for an argument's sake. I don't want to argue with them and win an argument. I could care less about that. But it's discouraging because the cross is not enough for them. And the preaching of the cross to them, because it's not enough, ultimately is foolish. And Paul continues on to say that. Let's read in verse 18. He says, For the preaching of the cross... It's to them that perish foolishness. Now, I don't know whether or not they're saved or not. I, I hope they are. But to many people, even people outside of my family and, and outside of the realm of my uh, acquaintances that I have discussions with, uh, they think this is foolishness. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that moving forward. But Paul says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? So, to me, it's frustrating, again, because the cross isn't enough. But looking at it from a unity's sake, or, or, or a church body's sake... The thing that's really discouraging to me is the lack of comfort that is absent or the comfort that is absent by the lack of unity between myself and my friends or myself and my family. And of course, that's who we care about probably the most, right? I mean, friends and family are somebody or, or are individuals that we really want to have harmony with. Nobody really wants to argue with family and friends, right? Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we'll see this displayed by Paul. Uh, look at Romans chapter 1, verse 8. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come, un, come, to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may, may be established. Now here's the kicker, verse 12. That is, that I may be comforted together by the mutual faith of both you and me. 
point blank. You know, when I first started studying with Jason, uh, I was kind of on my own. You know, I didn't really know too many individuals in here. Um, a lot of the stuff that I was studying was pretty new to me. And so when I would share the gospel or when I would kind of take minor persecutions, get, don't get me wrong, I'm not out there getting, <laughs> I'm not trying to say what was me, but it was encouraging to me to talk to Jason and be like, hey, man, uh, you know, I said X, Y, and Z, and I preached this gospel. And, you know, whatever response I got, I could share that with him and get some form of comfort by his experience, right? Or by his mutual faith in the, in the gospel. And that's the same thing I'm looking for or, or I would strive to see or love to see within my own circle of friends and family. But notice how this shares the same theme of 1 Corinthians, but in an opposite sense. Paul is saying, I'm comforted by the mutual faith of both you and I. But then in 1 Corinthians, he's saying, uh, let's clean up these divisions and let's get there, right? If you look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, I think this hits the nail on the head and really demonstrates what Paul is, is stressing in that, in that regard. He says in verse 1, if there be any consolation in Christ. Well, what consolation is he talking about? If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mer mercies, fulfill ye my, jo my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. I think, I think Paul really emphasize his ministry to not only preach the gospel, but to be unified in the faith with the churches that he was ministering to. Um, I do want to give, give you an example. So the other night I was, uh, I went to the Tampa Bay Rays game, and um, my mom uh, actually gets a, a four-pack of tickets to the uh, Hancock Bank pavilion so it's it's actually a nice area it's a it's a it's not it's kind of like a club area you know they have bars and couches and tables and all you can eat all you can drink and so I think this is my second or third time going this year and I took some guys with me and right when you walk in there's a there's a, a hot dog booth but it's a little bit more formal there's hot dogs sausages chili and wings <laughs> and the gentleman that works there I've seen him time and time again uh, he calls himself Brother Norwood. <laughs> and so when you go up to, to get a hot dog or something, he says, do you trust me? And you say, well, why well, trust me? He's like, well, let me give you a Brother Norwood special. And so he says, now, when you eat this special and you go sit down, just yell, hooty hoo, <laughs> and I'll come get you. I'll come pick you up, you know, because it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be real heavy. So we see Brother Norwood, as he calls himself, and uh, we go over and we're talking to him because we've seen him before, and he actually knows my dad, so we're talking about my dad a little bit, and, uh, and uh, the group of guys I was with were just talking to him. He actually gave my buddy a chef's, a Tampa Bay Rays chef's hat for his birthday the last time we went. So we were, we were carrying conversation about that, and... Uh, and so we were kind of eating to the side of his booth, just talking to him a little bit, just hanging out. And people were coming, you know, in and out, in and out to get, you know, sausages, hamburgers, hot dogs, whatever. And uh, he's very animated. He's very happy. He's very, he's just vibrant. And uh, when, 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 when ladies come up to see him, occasionally he'll start singing. And his voice is amazing. I don't know, Dad, if you've ever heard it, but uh, I guess what happened was Ben Zobris' wife came up to him one time to get a hot dog, and he started singing to her. And she said, hey, listen, I'm singing the national anthem. You need to come with me. I mean, he's that good. He's awesomely talented at singing. So we hear him singing here and there. And uh, one of the girls who, or somebody who came up to him said, you're so happy. And he goes, I have Jesus. Immediately. Like, it was like that. No, no questions asked. And, you know, as soon as you, you say Jesus, 
So it gets a little weird, right? So he said, I had Jesus. The girl walked away. So immediately I told me, okay, he may be a believer. He may have some form of, you know, understanding about God and whatnot. And um, so I started talking to him a little bit, and he started telling me how, um, you know, he's been studying the Bible and how he, 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 he just loves studying the Bible and, and preaching the gospel. Well, as I was talking to him about it, one of my friends brought up something to him that wasn't spiritual, right? It was kind of carnal. It was kind of worldly. And uh, he dove into that conversation a little bit. And then after, after talking and finishing that conversation, he goes, man, I, I got I to gotta clean up my act. You know, I got I to gotta change my thinking. You know, I, I need to not talk about that kind of stuff, right? And so I threw out this. I said, you must be a Roman six and sevener, right? And he goes, immediately when I said that, he goes, oh, he goes, I understand that. I said, no, I said, I said, you must understand Romans 6 and 7. He goes, oh, I understand it too well. And as soon as I said that, he started quoting Romans 7. Go ahead and look there. And I, I, I got goosebumps because it just blew my mind. That he started quoting this, and it was word for word, and it was a very, <laughs> it was a very long-winded quote of Romans 7. He said, if we, if we start in verse 15, he said, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. And keep in mind, he's reciting this in the King James. So everybody else around me is like, what is he talking about? <laughs> and he goes, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And he continued on. He goes, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more the I that do it, that, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And then he, he actually quoted all that. And then when this, when, when verse 24 came up, he like really shouted this, like in the middle of the Rays game. He goes, oh, wretched man that I am, <laughs> who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So you have to understand, I'm sitting there blown away. Like my mind is just out in left field and I hadn't watched, I mean this is probably 30, 45 minute discussion. I hadn't watched a pitch of the game. And by this time all my friends left and, uh, and I, said, I, said, well, I said, well keep going. I said, don't stop there. I said, keep going. Give me the good news. And then I started saying, I, I was pretty rusty on this, but I, I started saying, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And then I got stuck in verse 2 right here. I was trying to recite it, and he actually picked up for me. He goes, <laughs> he goes, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And this is really the good news right here in verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. And verse 4 is just the, the asterisk, the one that I have starred. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, this guy, he, he recited to me, you know, half of Romans chapter 7 and a little bit into Romans chapter 8. He's a really cool guy. You know, it's, it's fun to see this. And I said, I said, man, I said, that's what is so encouraging to me is to have that Romans 1 comfort. But I said also 2 Corinthians chapter 1 comfort. And I said, are you familiar with that? And so I, I pulled out my phone. I read it, I read it together because I don't have it 
memorized, but if you go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> I mean, this doesn't really relate to comfort of, of mutual faith, but it can. It talks about sufferings, but it's, it's just very, it's a consolation to have one another in Christ fighting the same battle, you know. Paul says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are all in Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For, the, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted is for your consolation and salvation, which is the effectual and the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. You know, Paul really emphasizes suffering so much in his ministry, which rightfully so, based on what he went through. But even in today with, you know, the gospel we preach and the message we preach, you know, the, the verbal assault will be demonstrated to us time and time again if we are faithful to that ministry. You know, I told him, I said, it's encouraging to know, I, I, we read this together, I said, it's encouraging to know that we are one in Christ, and no matter what happens in this life, we have the consolation of that with one another. And he goes, he goes, hey man, come back and see me when things slow down. You know, because he was, you know, it was the beginning of the game, he was, you know, serving a lot of food and stuff. And so I came back, and we started talking a little bit more, and, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see what he said next. He goes, he goes, you know, I do understand Romans 6 and 7 very well. He goes, but that doesn't give me an excuse to not be a Colossians 3-er. And I'm like, man, well, what does that say? <laughs> so I pulled out my phone, and we started going. And uh, he started reciting this to me. And I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. I said, stop. I said, how do you have all this memorized? And he goes, he goes, do you, he goes, did you, because when I started reciting a little bit of the verses, I started just having some dialogue with him about, you know, grace and the understanding of right division. And he goes, when I came back, he goes, did you go to, did you go to a seminary or Bible school or something? I said, no, man. I said, uh, I just started studying with a friend and, you know, I said, I'm a right divider. And he goes, oh, you're a second Timothy 2.15. I said, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and and uh, so I said, go ahead and recite to me Colossians 3. So I'm on my phone reading, and he's going down. He goes, if ye then be risen with Christ, and he understands being risen with Christ by Romans chapter 6, and we'll, we'll get there in a second. We'll go through that. But he goes, if ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, for fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetedness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in, which, <clears throat> in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not, to, not, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So he's reciting all this, and I said, hey man, how do you, how, tell me about yourself. Tell me where you came to this knowledge. And he, he started sharing with me his testimony, and it was just wild. I mean, he... You know, he's from St. Pete, and he was from the streets. You know, 
hustling and, and, and just living in all, all sorts of, of sin that we can just imagine. And he got a break by having a job or getting a job, um, uh, I think it was with the city or something like that. Or no, I think it was Subway. He works three jobs. He does, he does a raise game, he does Subway, and he does something else. I think with the school system, I don't know. But he goes, I, someone preached the gospel to me, and I started reading the Bible, and he goes, I don't go to church anywhere. He goes, I don't go to church anywhere because everywhere I go, they have denominationalism attached to them. And this is what he's telling me. And I said, I said, oh, man, you got to come with me. But <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I don't call myself a Christian because the times you see, most of the time you see Christian in the Bible, it's non-believers calling believers Christians. He, call, he says, I call myself justified. I call myself a son of God. And he goes, every week I open the Bible and I do my best to memorize passages. He goes, I have a two-year-old daughter and like an 18-year-old son. And he goes, I do everything I can to instill this in my daughter. And he, he's, he's, he told me he's 42, and he's going to St. Pete College for musical production. He's, he wants to be a singer. But it was so encouraging to see him understand Colossians and Romans 6 and 7, Colossians 3 and Romans 6 and 7, and kind of unify the two in his ministry. And so I invited him to church, and he was going to come today, but uh, he's got to work. I think it's a 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock game, so he had to, he had to work today. But, uh, but he goes, uh, he's like, I can't go anywhere where they don't preach the gospel. I'm like, man, you know I'm preaching. <laughs> it was so good. I mean, we talked for probably 90 minutes, and the guys, you know, when I went and found him again, you know, they were busting my chops. But I told him, I said, hey, man, you know, I, it's, it's, you can't stop teaching or talking about it when you know it's truth, you know. And uh, so I, I do want to go through Romans 6 and 7 a little bit, and uh, we'll kind of go through this really quick and then close out with a few other scriptures. But I think the thing that Brother Norwood understood about Romans 6 and 7 was he's justified in Christ, and he should mortify the deeds of his body. He should renew his mind because he's risen with Christ. But he understands that it's a constant battle of spirit and flesh, flesh and spirit. If you read uh, Romans 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin, understand that it says dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Similar to Colossians chapter 3. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall all be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, <clears throat> that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. See, we have to understand that once we're in Christ, we're actually buried with him, we're dead with him, we're risen with him, and then we're free from sin. If you understand that, you go, man, that is some good news. Because it takes a legalistic par portion of religion out of your message and gives you the freedom to receive that grace. If you look at verse 14 in Romans chapter 6, Paul says, For, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed 
from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Well, how do we become free from sin? Well, we know that if we're dead with Christ, risen with him, we're made free from that law of condemnation. <clears throat> I talked a little bit about that a couple weeks ago uh, in 2 Corinthians where you know, it talks about we're under that law or the ministration of death. And uh, Paul also lays that out in Romans chapter 2. <clears throat> but if you look at Romans chapter 7, I think Paul gives the perfect analogy because when, when I started studying I really had a hard time understanding Romans chapter 6. I had to read it over and over and over and understand, and, and it was hard for me to understand the mechanics, right? But if you read Romans 7, Paul gives you a perfect illustration of what he's talking about. <clears throat> if you start in verse 1, Paul says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. I think here he's referring to the law that God gave Moses, but I think everybody in this room understands the law in that sense, as well as the law that we have in our own judicial system. He says, How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And then he relates it to our spiritual sense in Christ in verse 4. He goes, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So you mean, as soon as I'm justified and I'm put in Christ... I'm dead to the law, I can't sin. He says, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So, you know, my experience with, with the gentleman at the Rays game, and I don't mean to keep going back to that, but it was such a good analogy or illustration for my own experience because he told me, he said, listen, I understand it too well that I almost use it as an excuse sometimes to sin. But, he said, that doesn't give me an excuse not to be a Colossians 3-er, which really comforted me, you know, because that really gives you understanding of what we should do as members in the body of Christ. Um, I, was, I was talking to another gentleman this past week at Indian Rocks Christian. Uh, it's actually the head coach over there. <clears throat> and uh, I was talking to him because I think Courtney told him I was speaking a couple weeks ago. And I was going through this topic of justification and, you know, dealing with different sin and still being saved. And he goes, the way I understand it or the way I've always, not I've always, but the way I kind of try to picture it in my mind is it's your current state versus, versus your standing in Christ, right? So you have your standing in Christ as being made righteous, and we'll look at that in Romans chapter 5 in a minute. We're made righteous in Christ, but our current state in this flesh could be different things. It could be a very polished and established individual in Christ who has mortified the deeds of the body and and studied to show themselves as workmen approved. Or you could be a babe in Christ that is still dealing with a lot of sin and hasn't studied and so on and so forth. So that really hit me. I was like, that's a good, that's a good point. So if you look at Romans chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 17, I don't know if we have to turn any pages, but Paul talks about being made righteous here. And we'll correlate this with 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says in verse 17, referring to Adam and Jesus Christ in both senses, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more than they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift 
came upon all men unto justification. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Adam's disobedience fell down unto every man <clears throat> under the law. Paul says in verse 19, So by the obedience of one, referring to Jesus Christ, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> so, I told this gentleman at the Rays game, I said, you know what, man? I said, what I think the problem is in today's churchianity or, or, or religion of you know, being a so-called Christian is many individuals can recite to you Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and not of yourself is the gift of God, etc., etc. But I told him, I said, I don't think people really understand what grace is. Because if you understand grace as the gift, you wouldn't put this legalistic standpoint on it by saying you can be saved, but you can't do X, Y, and Z. Or you can get justified in Christ, but lying, cheating, stealing, and so on and so forth negates that. And if, if you understand the gift that's imparted unto you of salvation, it really is good news because you understand that you're made righteous, you're made dead to the law, you're made free from sin, and you should bear fruits unto God. You know, it's the people that understand grace well, the people that do understand grace, in my opinion, by my experiences, are the ones that were at the bottom when they received this grace, right? If you look at Romans chapter 4, just a couple pages over, <clears throat> you understand that Paul talks about being justified while we are ungodly. And yeah, you know, it's just, it's encouraging to a person who's ungodly to receive this grace because they, don't, they know they don't deserve it. They don't have any righteousness of their own. But they can receive this grace and then live out Romans chapter 2. And we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. Paul says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father hath, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So if you look at Romans chapter 2, and you understand that your faith is counted for righteousness while you're ungodly, you're given this grace... You're given this grace. You understand that Romans chapter 6 and 7 makes you free in Christ. You understand that you're freed from the law and you're free from sin, where you actually can't sin in Christ. You can sin in this flesh, but not in Christ. And then you look at Romans chapter 2, and this doesn't really, if you look at the context of Romans 2, talking about the law and how it's condemning both the nation of Israel and the Gentiles, this isn't really, I'm not taking this in the proper context, but it can be applied to us as believers. If you look at Romans 2, verses 4, Paul says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Well, this goodness of God is, is, is demonstrated to us by Jesus Christ, dying for our sins, <clears throat> being delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification. But Paul also stresses this goodness or the riches of God's grace in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. 
start in verse 3. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, or to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 6 kind of directly relates back to Romans chapter 5, where Paul talks about God making us righteous. But he keeps going and he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You know, it really, it really is good news to understand the grace, the justification, and <clears throat> the freedom from sin. I was very, you know, I was excited, to be honest. You know, I was excited to see somebody like that who, he, he told me, I don't go to any church, you know. He says, I'm not opposed to it, I just haven't found one. Um, you know, his doctrine was spot on. <clears throat> and if people would listen to the message it would be such a benefit on their behalf. I mean, when I obviously when I started speaking this message, I, I told Jason, I said, look, man, I said, the reason that so many people are turned off to this is because church in today's society makes it so, it just, it makes it black. You don't want to go to church because of all the, the condemnation and the guilt that's bestowed upon you, you know, but if you actually listen to the message, you understand grace and you understand Romans 6 and 7 and the first part of Romans 8 where he talks about the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us by Christ doing it on behalf, who wouldn't want this, you know? The last thing he said to me, and this is the verse we'll close with, I mentioned something to him regarding his ministry. And, you know, I had goosebumps the whole time I'm talking to him because every time I mentioned something to him, he almost responded with a verse. And he said this. I, sa I said something along the lines of, well, well, you know, keep doing what you're doing, man. I'll, I'll give you a call about church Sunday or something like that. And he goes, he didn't respond. He goes, 2 Timothy 4, 4 verse 2. <laughs> he goes, preach the word. <laughs> He goes, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. And it's like, man, you know, he, he is so excited about this grace, and he's so on fire for Christ because he understands truth for what it is. And if you read in 2 Timothy verse four, or chapter 4, verse 2, or we'll just start in verse 1, Paul says to Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and, Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Paul says, preach the word. Be inst instant, in season, out of season. Repu reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. <clears throat> For the time will come when they will not endure such sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Oh, I should say, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. <clears throat> the gentleman just, just recited to me verses 2 of chapter 4, but, you know, as a disciple, or as a believer, and understanding grace, and understanding Romans 6 and 7, how we're made freed from sin, and understanding that the goodness and the riches of His grace leadeth us to repentance, you can't help yourself but preach what you know. And, you know, I hope that encourages you all to want to study and want to become more established in the Word because you can have a joy in your ministry by having the ammunition. Not in an inflammatory way, but more so in a way that gives people hope. You know, the, the young lady said, you're so happy or something like that. And immediately he said, I have Jesus. And of course, you know, as expected, that kind of turned her off. But there's going to come a point in time when one or two people 
are saying, what is this Jesus you're talking about? Or tell me more, you know. So I'll close with that. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll close in a word of prayer. And uh, I think Russ is in town next weekend. So, all right, let's close. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you for this day.